while he gets ready here. Colin is on his way here. Thank you. So Colin, so Colin Wormsley has been with the Missouri Department of Agriculture's Plant Pest Control Bureau since 2000, serving as a state entomologist and bureau manager since 2007. He's a Missouri native, having grown up on a sixth generation Missouri farm in the Missouri River Hills of uh, Pike County. And Colin actually earned his BS in agronomy and master's in entomology from Northwest Missouri State University. The office of uh, the state entomologist was established in 1868 and works towards preventing the introduction and spread of exotic plant pest in Missouri. And today, Colin is going to give us an update on urban pest. So, thank you, Colin. Thanks. Okay, can you all hear me okay? All right, well, um, yeah, probably so. Well, you've heard a lot of great talks today and a lot of positive things. You've seen beautiful plants and Marlon's talk, of course, was very positive and looking at community gardening. So uh, that's not what this is. This is a lot of doom and gloom. I'm just going to tell you up front. So uh, I'm going to go, yeah, I'm going to go over just uh, really kind of briefly just uh, four major invasive uh, forest pests. Um, but they are urban pests, um, particularly emerald ash borer and Asian longhorn beetle. Their impact really is in urban areas where they're killing trees and creating hazard trees that have to be dealt with by municipalities and, and property owners, homeowners. Uh, so my goal is, is just to go over these very briefly, make you aware of them, um, touch on some of the symptoms of some of them, and then uh, let you know who to report those to. Um, so, you know, we do a lot of survey work at the Missouri Department of Agriculture and also, you know, Kansas Department of Ag and others does a lot of survey work, uh, setting out traps, doing visual survey, survey. but really our, our best survey tools are just knowledgeable people out looking for these pests. And a really good example is when we discovered emerald ash borer two years ago in Kansas City. It wasn't one of our traps that discovered it. It was a, a very knowledgeable uh, arborist who was called out to deal with a, a dead ash tree. They got out there, they immediately recognized symptoms of emerald ash borer and they knew who to call. They called the, the uh, local forester with the Missouri Department of Conservation. So uh, really outreach and education is our best uh, survey tool. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about thousand cankers disease of black walnut. And maybe you've heard about this. Um, but to Missouri and, and Kansas also, it's a really big deal because walnut is a, just a huge economic and natural resource for us. Um, Missouri has about 55 million black walnut trees according to Forest Service data. It's more than twice as many as, as uh, the next uh, state. Um, we also produce a lot of black walnut nut meat in Missouri. Uh, we've got the world's largest uh, nut meat producer for black walnuts. In southwest Missouri, it's a third generation family business. Um, and uh, so it's a, it's a big business. We produce in Missouri about 16 million pounds on average of uh, black walnuts in the state every year. Uh, that's about four times as many as the second uh, state. So it's hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars um, that this tree means to us in Missouri. So thousand cankers disease though, it's um, native to the United States. Uh, the beetle uh, is native to the southwestern U.S. and northern Mexico. Uh, the fungus, however, uh, is basically new to science, but genetic work is showing that it likely, too, is, is native uh, to that region of the U.S. So at some point, they crossed paths and expanded their range, and the, uh, they've moved up into the, some of the northern states and the western United States and uh, started killing black walnuts out there. Black walnut's not native out in, in the western United States. Um, but just to talk about the disease just a little bit, the, the beetle is the vector of this fungus. And so um, Geosmithia morbida is the fungus. Um, and the, the walnut twig beetle carries the fungal spores on its body. And so the beetle goes and bores into a tree, into a walnut tree, inoculates the tree with the fungus, and you get these little cankers. But the, 
the walnut twig beetle has really high reproductive potential, so it can build up in the thousands or tens of thousands in a single tree. And although the beetle itself necessarily wouldn't do a lot of damage to the tree, all of these little fungal cankers that are killing the conductive tissue of the tree is what does the damage. So when you get thousands and thousands of these in a tree, uh, it kills it. Uh, just kind of a close up there, the, the walnut twig beetle, the, the vector is a tiny little brown beetle. It's about the size of an eye and the word liberty on a dime, to give you an idea. But you can see all the white on there. That's the fungal spores that, are got, that have gotten on the body of the beetle. And so when that beetle emerges from the tree covered with these spores and it goes to another part of the tree and bores in, or maybe it goes to another tree, uh, it re-inoculates a, a new spot in the tree. And you can see here, this is where the pupil chamber of the beetle is, and the, the fungus really concentrates in that area. And you get a lot of spore production there that covers the beetle and, and allows the beetle to carry it uh, onto a new spot. So this isn't a systemic infection where the tree would get inoculated in one spot and then it spreads through the whole tree. These are little individual localized cankers. Um, and so it's the repeated sustained attack by a growing beetle population is what kills the trees. To give you an idea of the reproduction potential, Colorado State University researchers took a couple of little sticks of wood, about firewood size, put them in rearing chambers, let the beetles emerge from the wood, and then probably some poor graduate student got to count all the little beetles, and they came up with over 23,000 beetles out of those two sticks of wood. So that was about 35 beetles per square inch of wood, if, to just give you an idea. Uh, so the symptoms, um, th these beetles like to go to the top of a tree first and then, you know, work their way down with each generation. So initial symptoms you're going to see is just maybe a little yellow twig flagging. Uh, then you'll start noticing a little wilting, browning leaves. The brown leaves are sticking to the twigs. You'll get larger branch dieback as time goes on. Um, the thing is, though, once the beetle first inoculates or infests a tree, um, they can be there for six, maybe eight years before you start seeing a lot of symptoms in the tree. So it's really there cooking, you know, building up in numbers. Um, but then once you start seeing those first symptoms, that tree's gonna be gone pretty soon, maybe in a couple of years, three or four years possibly, if it's in a good planting site. Uh, a few more symptoms to look for, tiny little exit holes, but on, on black walnut that's got big rough bark, the exit holes are gonna be nearly impossible to see. And then also under the bark, um, you might see these little transverse galleries. This is where thousand cankers disease is known to be right now. Of course, we first discovered it out in the western U.S. Um, where black walnut is not native. But if you can see kind of that gray hash mark area in the eastern U.S., that's where black walnut is native. Um, so in 2010, it was discovered in Knoxville, Tennessee, and since then, uh, four other states. Uh, I don't have Maryland on the map, but it was the walnut twig beetle recently was discovered in Maryland from some trapping they were doing. Um, they have not yet found it in standing uh, walnut trees. They haven't found the disease yet, uh, but they're surveying for that now. Uh, several states have quarantines, including Missouri and Kansas, so that restricts movement of walnut into our states. Any kind of walnut wood that would uh, carry the disease or the beetle with it. So uh, firewood, um, walnut logs, green lumber that hasn't been treated, walnut nursery stock, and so forth. Um, the nuts, the nut meats, and the hulls, they do not transmit thousand cankers disease, so those are safe to, to move around. Uh, we've done a lot of survey in Missouri. Kansas has also, of course. Uh, we work with the Missouri Department of Conservation in Missouri, so both of our agencies do a lot of survey. A new development just in the last couple of years, though, um, has been that uh, a U.S. Forest Service researcher uh, identified some pheromones produced by the walnut twig beetles uh, that really aid in survey. Prior to this, we just did visual survey, and this is just really difficult uh, to do. It's not very successful, but uh, now we can use these Lindgren funnel traps that you see there on the right and bait those with uh, pheromones from the walnut twig beetles. Uh, so we've covered the state uh, pretty intensively with survey over the last couple of years. We have not found it in Missouri or Kansas. Uh, just real quickly on gypsy moth, 
Uh, you maybe don't hear a lot about gypsy moth. Uh, it's been in the United States since the late 1800s. Uh, we've been surveying for it in Missouri for about 45 years now. In Missouri, we do catch gypsy moths every year, but it's uh, not established. It's kind of a hitchhiker pest. They'll lay their eggs on just about anything, uh, semi-trucks, railroad cars, RVs, just anything. And so the egg masses get transported, and then they hatch out, and you can get a new population established. Um, so uh, there's a really great program called Slow the Spread that USDA is operating in cooperation with a lot of states. And so if you, that red area on the map there, that's where a gypsy moth is established. So the Slow the Spread program, or STS, operates on that western leading edge, and they do a lot of intensive survey, and then they have some really good tools that they can use to, to treat along that, that leading edge and try to hold that population from moving westward. Um, so that's been a really successful program. It's kept the movement of gypsy moth uh, back to about three miles per year. Without STS, um, it, it would be moving a lot faster, and, and according to modeling that they do, it would already be well into Missouri at this point. Um, why we're concerned about gypsy moth in Missouri, especially, uh, we've got about 16 million acres of forest land in Missouri, and most of that uh, is predominantly oak. Oak is the, the favorite host of, of gypsy moth. It's a defoliator. Um, it'll defoliate the trees, and if you have that happening year after year, it'll weaken the trees and eventually kill them. Uh, so we do a lot of survey for gypsy moth. Um, like I said, we catch some in Missouri every year. Last year we caught five, uh, five moths total, but no reproducing populations. Uh, but this is the trapping history in Missouri, and you can see we've, we've caught a lot over the years, and they're really clustered over these urban areas, St. Louis, Kansas City, and then down in southwest Missouri around Branson where there's a lot of tourism. So again, this is a pest that's moved by, um, it's in population centers where there's a lot of traffic, a lot of people movement, and also tourism. Um, Emerald ash borer, and just a real quick update, and particularly because we're here on a state line area, um, just important to kind of know what's going on. So it's in, I, I forget, 21, 22 states now. Uh, this past year it was discovered way out west in Boulder, Colorado. Um, it's been found in, it was in New Hampshire, Georgia, and North Carolina also discovered it this year. Um, here in the Kansas City area, uh, well, this is the quarantine map, so it's important to know there's a, a federal quarantine on. Um, so basically you can move regulated articles within that big yellow area, but not out of it. Regulated articles would be like uh, ash logs, green lumber, all hardwood firewood is quarantined, uh, but also things like um, ash tree debris. So if you're operating as an arborist like in a state line area like this and you're um, doing tree trimming in one area and then moving the debris to some other area, it's really important to know where those quarantine boundaries are. So here in the Kansas City area in 2012, we discovered it um, in Platte County, Missouri, and then across the line here in Wyandotte County, Kansas. Um, since then, we found it in Johnson County, Kansas, and Jackson County, Missouri. Uh, but last year, because of all the new discoveries we had in Missouri of Emerald Ash Borer, we went ahead and went to a statewide quarantine um, but what that means, if you're here in the Kansas City area and you might be moving regulated articles back and forth, um, you can move those things from Missouri into Kansas only if you're going into Wyandotte or Johnson County. You can't move beyond that with, you know, tree debris or, you know, other ash material. Um, so if, you've, if you are doing that, if you're an arborist and you're making that movement and you've got questions about it, you can either contact uh, either Missouri Department of Ag or Kansas Department of Ag or uh, USDA. This is where we currently have it in Missouri that, that we know of, and that's always the disclaimer. Uh, but it was first found in Wayne County, Missouri, down in southeast uh, back in 2008, and since then we've had several new detections from, from one side of the state to the other. And I always say that's where we know it is because our we have a trap that we can use, um, but it's not a terribly effective trap. Um, and so if we trap in an area and don't find the beetle, basically all we can say is, well, we trapped there and we didn't find it. We don't necessarily know whether it's there or not. Um, 
So what are we doing now? Um, we've been doing biocontrol releases in Missouri since 2012 down in southeast Missouri. Uh, there's three species of parasitic wasps that we've released. These are developed, or I should say reared by uh, USDA up in Michigan, and they've been supplying those to the states. Um, in 2014, we're looking at doing uh, some limited releases in Platte County, Missouri of these parasitic wasps. Um, we're gonna continue to survey and trying to keep up with where it might be in the state. Um, we've continued to work with municipalities and helping them prepare, encouraging them to do tree inventories, know where your ash trees are and preparing and maybe even looking at selective removal of declining ash trees. Uh, continuing to do outreach. Of course, there's a regulatory effort as well. Uh, and in Missouri, we also have the Missouri Invasive Forest Pest Council, and this is kind of a multi-agency group that coordinates on activities to make sure that we're using our resources kind of collectively and not stepping over each other and, and uh, just everybody doing their part. Something that I really haven't spent much time talking on in the past, yeah, Dr. Cloyd? Yeah, you might want to mention that the way this thing gets around is mostly because of firewood is being removed from one location to the other. That's a good point. There's a lot of ways that emerald ash borer, and actually a lot of these forest pests, um, a lot of ways they can move around, logs, you know, untreated lumber, things like that. But firewood in particular is, is just seems like the primary way this thing moves long distance. The emerald ash borer or Asian longhorn beetle too, they don't fly very far on their own steam, uh, but they can move cross country in a weekend with someone going camping and carrying it in the back of their pickup truck. And I mean, I've done that myself, you know, you don't wanna go to a campground and pay for firewood and when you've got your own, you know, from home. But um, I think that's one way that emerald ash borer has gotten moved long distances throughout the country is, um, and firewood, you know, you've got dead or dying trees, you cut them down, use them for firewood, and if you take them long distances, then you've just spread this thing in another state far away. And that's how we were pretty sure that we got it in Missouri for the first time, was it was a very isolated area in southeast Missouri. Um, it was at a federal campground. Uh, there was no nursery stock movement or mills near my, nearby or anything like that. It was just, it was firewood. Um, so the Asian longhorn beetle, um, um, just real quickly, um, it's native to Asia, obviously. Uh, we think it moved to the United States in uh, solid wood packing material. But again, this is one that's been moved around the country probably in, in firewood uh, once it got here. Um, it's, a, it's a longhorn beetle. You can see how it got its name. Um, but it's the, the larval stage uh, that does the damage in the tree. So it's, and I'll show here in just a second how it bores through, but it's a, you can see it's a really big, robust larva. Kind of only a face that a mother could love or, a, or an entomologist. Uh, it's got a lot of hosts. With emerald ash borer, ash is the only host for that insect. But for Asian longhorn beetle, it's got a lot of different host trees. Maple seems to be its preferred host. Um, a lot of different types of maples, um, but also um, ash, birch, uh, elms, a lot of other trees are, I guess you could say some of these are more minor hosts. Um, so uh, if you remember your entomology classes, um, beetles have a complete uh, life cycle. It's um, egg, larva, pupa, adult. And again, it's the larva that do really does the boring and the, and the damage in the tree. And uh, all stages, except the adults, uh, can survive the winter. Um, the, the beetles are killed by, by frosts in the fall. Um, so how does the beetle kill the tree? Um, just looking at you know, the tree here, the, the emerald ash borers would feed kind of in that phloem area, but Asian longhorn beetles just move right on, on through the tree. So there's really a lot of damage to the wood, so you're not necessarily gonna be able to salvage uh, that wood maybe the way you would with emerald ash borer, uh, ash wood that's been killed by EAB. And you can see some of the damage here where it's really drilling right on through uh, to the heartwood. So just kind of a little graphical display here. The first couple of instars uh, of the larva kind of bore through the phloem and the cambium there, getting into the xylem. But then these later instars really drill deep into the wood. You can see some kind of that early damage there. 
in the tree, and then here's later where they've drilled right on in. So just looking at some more of the you know, branch breakage, the structural integrity of the tree really becomes an issue with this pest. So uh, what do we look for with uh, Asian longhorn beetle? The a couple of different types of holes that you, you'd be looking for. Um, a lot of egg niches here, and we'll show that in here in just a second. Here's an exit hole uh, where the adult beetle is actually emerging from the tree. These are really large, and uh, it's just about the size of a number two pencil. You've still got enough room to really move that pencil in and out of there. And then also the other types of holes you're going to see are these egg niches where the, the female chews into the bark a little bit, and then she lays an egg into that, that little area there. Um, so you'll really notice a lot of these egg niches um, on a tree that has Asian longhorn beetle. Now there's, there's longhorn beetles that are native to this part of the United States, and you might see this kind of damage on other trees, particularly uh, oaks, maybe like pin oaks or red oaks. Uh, get a, a red oak borer. There's also a, another type of longhorn beetle that attacks oaks. If you see that on oak, there are some native borers there, but if you're seeing this kind of damage on maples in particular, you really want to take a closer look and, and probably report that uh, to a, like Kansas Department of Ag or Missouri Department of Ag or your local extension agent. Uh, you'll also see kind of, particularly on maples, some weeping uh, where the egg niches have been chewed out. Again, you can see that extensive, extensive damage there. There's an egg that's been laid in the, the egg niche there and a little burst in star, in star larva. Uh, you can also look for frass in these trees. And with these longhorn beetles, um, really have coarse, kind of splintery looking frass. So you can look for, look for that. It's been found in several locations in the United States, uh, first in New York back in 1996. Several of these other locations, Chicago, Long Island, New Jersey. Um, there's a good thing about this pest is you can still, I guess, use the word eradication with this pest. Um, emerald ash borer, that's not really the case. A thousand cankers disease, even um, eradication is not really possible. Um, but with Asian longhorn beetle, there has been some success stories of eradication. It's, it's a long road and it requires the destruction of a lot of trees, but they have done it. Most recent uh, find of, of Asian longhorn beetle in the United States was in uh, southern Ohio, uh, kind of near the Cincinnati area. Um, that's the nearest uh, known population to this area. So more information on ALB, go to beetlebusters.info. A lot of great information on that website. Uh, I'm not going to talk about these other pests, but just to mention um, brown marmorated stink bug, um, something to keep an eye out for. It's a bad pest for a few different reasons. Uh, it's really a severe pest of fruit and vegetable crops, but it also has some other behavioral characteristics that make it a, an urban pest problem. Um, you know the lady beetles that like to congregate in your home in the fall and the winter and build up in big numbers and really a nuisance? Well, brown marmorated stink bug, the one there on the left, uh, has that same behavioral characteristic. So out east, where it was first found in the United States several years ago, and the populations have built up, um, these things are building up in people's houses in the winter by the thousands or tens of thousands. Plus, they stink really bad. So a uh, lot of reasons to, to be on the lookout for that pest and report it if you see it. So with that, um, here's some contact information. If you see any of these pests and you want to report it, in Missouri, Missouri Department of Ag, or the uh, Conservation Department Foresters, or University Extension in Kansas, Kansas Department of Ag, K-State Extension, or the Kansas Forest Service. So with that, thanks. Thank you so much. Any questions for Colin? Just maybe one question? No, OK, good, OK. Oh, just one question, sorry. Uh, sometime last year, some company in town started advertising in the Kansas City Garden magazine that there was now a treatment for emerald ash borer, and it was based on, I think, research done at Ohio State or something like that. Have you seen that? Is there any basis of fact to that? There are some treatments that are successful for emerald ash borer. Um, the thing is, though, that um, if you want to do treatments for emerald ash borer, EAB is in your area.
you're really committed to doing that as long as you want that free to live. Sure. Um, so emit corporate is an active ingredient uh, that has had some success within the last four. There's also a product called uh, triage, with, which is uh, MMECT and benzoate. Um, I think there's some others. Dr. Floyd, you might be able to yeah, the the, the main, these are all systemic, so they have to be applied almost like preventatively okay. because the galleries created by the larva will block the movement systemic, especially in the clone. Uh, so the midocoprid is used, dinitefron, which is safari, and then as uh, Colin mentioned, is triage, mmectin benzoate, and the Michigan data shows that mmectin benzoate treatments will give you two years of control, whereas the other two have to be annual applications. You can do it every year, but the mmectin benzoate triage which is only applied by a professional, uh, will give you two years of control of emerald ash borer in healthy ash trees. So, do you buy it in like early spring or when is the best time to for, There are two schools of thought. Okay. Um, either late uh, fall application, mid fall, or early spring. If you're using Safari, you can get away the spring treatment because it's very water soluble. Mm -hmm. But if you're using Metacloprid, you might want to think about a fall application because it's less water soluble than, 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 than dinotephron is. So uh, the water solubility is the basis for either fall or spring application. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Goldberg. I may have missed it. Did you say treat now? Is that what we're saying? Is that what somebody? I missed it. Are you guys saying treat now your ash trees in our area? Um, it's, it's an option. You know, if you've got, uh, and there's... Because, I mean, the tree guys are pounding it on some people. You know, you need to do it, you need to do it. They're scaring people. I tell them not to do it now. I mean, if, if it's really, if it's in your area and you've got some high-value trees that, that you just want to protect, or maybe you want to buy some time to plant some other trees and let them get some size on them, that's a possibility. But, again, if you choose to treat, if emerald ash borer is in your area, you're, you're committed to doing that from now on. As long as you want that freedom. Sure. Over time, yeah. Yeah, the, the triage in particular yeah, is pretty triage expensive. Is really expensive yeah. Yeah. Because we had some people tell us that it was going to cost them $1,200 or something like that. That's too much. That seems pretty steep yeah. Yeah. for any of those treatments. Yeah. Be careful. There's a lot of scare tactics, yeah. Yeah. money generating okay. revenue going on right now. So get get educated. If you have questions, like Colin said, contact the unbiased extension officer, Katie, or the uh, Forest Services. So we have some good publications available uh, for the homeowner too. So yeah. Call the Kent State Extension Office. Uh, university or extension offices, uh, you know, hardy, hardy extension because offices. Because when we're out doing tree trims, we've had, you know, people tell us that, you know, they wanted to treat their trees and they were going to be charged, you know, twelve, twelve, $1,200 or more to get their tree trees. Yeah, get, get, get educated because people will take advantage of that. Yes. They are. 